Welcome to the Martin Roth Symposium 2020 from the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. The symposium aims to bring together thought leaders from the cultural, the academic, the artistic and political sectors to share ideas and scenarios. Presented by IFA, the Institute for Auslandsbeziehungen, in cooperation with Republika, this second Martin Roth Symposium takes place as a digital theme week from 7th to 11th September 2020. Also, kindly supported by the Museum für Naturkunde Berlin and funded by Germany's Federal Foreign Office. And today is all about museums and architecture. The meaning and function of museums has shifted fundamentally in the course of history. Looking back to the early days, focusing on collection to today's concepts for museums emphasizing exhibition and education programs and developing local and global communities. Museums are seen as public spaces, but who do they belong to and how? What are the conditions and modes of access that serve collections and encourage a dialogue between objects and people? What are the options for showing materials that are stored, that are vulnerable and that are contested? Today we will address the nature of space in our current museums with an eye on both the past and the future. And we're going to talk about trends and how they establish new domains in old places. What will it take to create spaces where the public and artifacts can come together outside of their familiar settings, negotiating relationships between the open and the closed or the local and the global, between the hauntings of history and the promise of utopia. We start again with sprints. These are 10 minute inputs where speakers present their thoughts on our today's topic, museum and architecture. With us today is Birgit Kuriger. She's the artistic director of the Foundation Vincent van Gogh. We have the architect David Chipperfield with us and also Luisa Hutton, architect and co-founder of Sauerbruch Hutton. David Ajaye, architect and founder of Ajaye Associates and Pina Yoldas, infradisciplinary architect and a professor at the University of California in San Diego. Following the speakers, we will have another deep dive as we're already familiar with it. It's an exchange between you the participants and the speakers. And here you can meet our speakers of today for Q&A's after the sessions. And as we are all in the virtual space, it will be a 15 minute live online exchange in a digital discussion room. In case you need further information, don't hesitate. Click on the button, the buy sign, take part on the website campus.republica.com. Before opening for questions and comments by you, some first responders present their thoughts on the sprint. It's a kickoff for our lively discussion. And our first responders of today are Edwin Heathcote. He's an architect, designer and journalist. And Bill Sherman, director of the Warburg Institute and professor of cultural history at the University of London. And also today, we close the day with the Future Forward session, a moderated conversation between a forward-thinking professional and a student responder. And in this combination again, with a look into today's topic from different perspectives and backgrounds. Let's start. Let's start with the sprints of today. Good afternoon. My name is Biche Kuriger. I'm very pleased to be able to speak here in memory of Martin Roth. I personally met him in Venice in 2015 when the Biennale and the Victoria and Albert Museum were planning a collaboration. I'm actually speaking to you from Zurich, but I would like to present my recent work in the south of France. There, six years ago, we inaugurated the Fondation Vincent van Gogh Arles. I know you're going to think how boring it must be to run a museum dedicated to a single artist. And even more so, one dedicated to good old Vincent, an artist thoroughly battered by mass cultural success. But it's quite the opposite, I assure you. Today's artists, the ones with whom we collaborate, offer unexpected insights that sharpen our view of the past. With regard to my work in Arles, I would like to pick out two aspects in connection with today's theme. First, the collaboration with artists already began in the planning phase of constructing and renovating the building. 
Second, the exhibition program follows a confrontational and expansive principle, but more about that later. The desire arose early on for the building itself to show the strongest presence of artists, but not like a decorative brooch, not after the fact when everything was finished. Fortunately, we had Guillaume Avenard, a young architect who embraced this plan with great openness and sensitivity. And so the entrance now makes a strong signal-like statement, a self-reflexive logo, since the French artist Bertrand Lavier has transformed the signature Vincent into a sculptural tag, painted or better sculpted in Van Gogh's manner, a cartoon as a pastose brushstroke, as a strong 3D icon, about 12 meters wide, black on white, with a few accents in yellow and green. The portal now clearly expresses our will to address the mass cultural reception of Van Gogh as an uber artist in our work. At the same time, another artist, the young Raphael Hefti, a 34-year-old newcomer at the time, was invited to develop a work for the roof of the bookshop in the entrance. I knew about his work with glass, that um, he intervenes in the industrial production process in the manufacture of non-reflexive museum glass. He encourages the workers to do everything wrong, and that's how the most wonderful effects are created. Today, the glass roof of the bookstore consists of more than 70 very different glass rectangles distributed vertically, each one unique, violet green and iridescent, opaque, pink transparent with a gold shimmer and much more. In advance, engineers simulated the incidence of sunlight over the year to make sure that the reflections, the myriad spots of color that wander across the interior of the bookstore and the entire courtyard when the weather is fine, would indeed be an immaterial homage to Van Gogh. Raphael Hefti, thus, does not use color foils to make color dance. I hope you recognize the metaphorical potential of transforming a ubiquitous industrial building material, glass, in what you might call an alchemical process, so that it can radiate in a completely new way. Let me describe one specific exhibition that exemplifies our curatorial work. Soleil chaud, soleil tardif, Hot Sun, Late Sun from 2018 brought together such illustrious names as Van Gogh, Picasso, Germaine Richier, Alexander Calder, and Joe Mitchell, Giorgio de Chirico, and Ethel Adnan. But the focus was not only on Van Gogh, who embodies the moment when the sun of modernity was at its zenith, but also on Sun Ra the eccentric African-American jazz musician and performer who died in 1993 and who made a great impact in the early 1970s, especially in France. Sun Ra's name refers to the Egyptian sun god Ra, as do his costumes and the ecstatic performances in the mostly 10 to 15 member ensemble, which also included African dancers. There are a surprising number of long TV recordings of Sun Ra, including performances at the Fondation Macht near Nice, an important French institution around 1970, which played a prominent role in the popularization and democratization of art. Using 19, 1970 as a linchpin, 
we focus back on Vincent and forward to our present as well. Why 1970? Picasso was then 90 years old and would die soon. The thesis is that it was also the beginning of postmodernism. We also showed Sigmar Polke's satire of 1968 on modern art, a picture that makes fun of the automatisms and hollow formulas of modernity. 1970 stands for a period in which art functioned as an important cultural laboratory. When Picasso died, the Communist Party in Paris organized a large Picasso exhibition on the occasion of the Fête de l'Humanité in a tent in a park at the same time in the same place and presented by the same organizers Sun Ra appeared in front of tens of thousands of people with his orchestra. This, I admit, somewhat blatant example sums up how forgotten historical work surprisingly connects with a figure like Van Gogh, if one is guided by curiosity and unprejudiced openness. In times of great upheaval, I pleaded, pleaded for an expanded art history with a selective and thoughtful response to popular culture, both historical and contemporary. This can also include arts and crafts or subcultures. In museums, we have to move away from a too puristically heroic art history with its fetishization of the masterpiece, away from a history that remains too much in the conventions of the canonical narrative of the history of style and form. But I also plead for differentiated, intelligent exploitation of the potential of the museum and art history to protect, defend, and at the same time, open up the art discourse. The museum represents a productive in-between space, but it is important to keep clearing the space to make sure there is room for the unexpected. A museum is both expansive and introverted. Today, it is also necessary to break through the white cube routine. There is too much cold perfection at work. We have to build in heat factors. And here, I would like to come back to Van Gogh. His humanism, his love of nature and simple life, I would like to end with a quote from a letter to his sister. Don't feel uncomfortable about hanging my paintings in the corridor, in the kitchen, in the stairs. My painting is done above all to be seen against a simple background. A Van Gogh in a kitchen. Let's be surprised. I'm looking forward to the discussion in the deep dive. Thank you. Good evening. I'm honored to be invited here, wherever here is nowadays, to talk about the future of museums, especially in memory of our friend Martin Roth, who did so much to influence the mission and responsibility of museums, who was so dedicated to their role as places to transfer ideas, to educate, to promote liberties, and to stimulate intellectual and moral debate. Obviously, it's a difficult time to talk about the future of anything right now. As so many museums remain closed and others slowly try to reopen under stringent requirements of social spacing and restricted numbers, not to mention the routines of sanitization. It is not easy to speculate how this crisis will affect the way museums will operate in the future. We can at least consider the general tendencies of museums before the COVID-19 pandemic. 
In this case, we can reflect on a remarkable period since the 1990s, where we have not only seen a proliferation of new museums and extensions, but also a radical change in their popularity and in their mission. We have witnessed museums redefine themselves, not just as repositories of beautiful artifacts, but also as places of education, instruction and dialogue. During these years, museums have tried to broaden their audience, extend their outreach and expand their cultural and social significance. Not all of this has been seen as positive and the growth in visitor numbers also reflects the financial pressures that cultural institutions have been subjected to. The, de the desire to be more relevant comes with costs and puts pressures on facilities and resources. It has also in some cases eroded the detached and contemplative atmosphere that is so important to the quality of the museum and has ensured their role as sanctuaries from everyday life. In general terms, museums have aspired to evolve from a specific destination into somewhere to go. In this process, the museum offer has become more complete and appealing, not only through program, but through amenities and activities. This dynamic dimension is perhaps the biggest change in the contemporary museum since its 19th century origins. This desire to open up and to add other, to add other facilities and opportunities to both cater for and attract growth in visitor numbers has been the motivation for so much new museum architecture over the last 30 years. One other consideration that cannot be overlooked is the extraordinary shift in the world of contemporary art. Its impact is felt across all sectors of the process, from the content, scope and ambitions of the artists, the importance of commercial galleries, the soaring value of work itself and the growth of collectors all of which has had a profound effect on the role and profile of contemporary art museums in particular, but also generally on all museums and cultural institutions. Contemporary art has given museums an alternative profile to the earnest academic institutions they historically are, turning them into something that belongs to, stimulated by and reflects contemporary life. What role has architecture played in all of this? There's no doubt that museum architecture has been important, both to the expansion of programming, the desire to make museums more accessible, and importantly, to their profiling and visibility on a global stage. From the position of the architect, the museum commission itself is a very desirable one, as it draws on the fundamentals of architecture, the making of good spaces, the careful consideration of light, the sequence and orientation of spaces, and all of this in collaboration normally with clients who tend to be encouraging, supportive and patient to the creative process. Despite these broad trends and changes, it is impossible to really talk now about the future without considering the effects of COVID. Perhaps the most asked question in the architectural community at the moment is how architecture will change as a result of the pandemic. Of course, we don't know what post COVID means or when it might happen. Either we solve it and then there's no real reason to change or we don't solve it and all bets are off. Unfortunately, there is no doubt that there will be a big fallout, even if it disappears quickly. Many institutions have closed, will close and everyone will suffer from economic damage. How do public buildings change if people can no longer meet together or sit near each other? I don't know what this future could look like and probably it's not worth contemplating yet. Perhaps it's more interesting to consider how the changes that might be forced on us could align with changes that we might have eventually encouraged ourselves to do if they hadn't been forced on us. I think many of us are muttering the same mantra of hope that the pandemic comes with a silver lining and stimulates us to challenge the way we have been behaving up to this point. Strangely, of course, the situation doesn't really provoke those of us who are not from the medical or scientific community to reflect on the nature of the virus itself, but rather to reflect on what, is it, what it has exposed 
in the way we normally conduct ourselves, on how the pandemic has emphasized these conditions and without doubt exposed the failings in our social systems, the lack of protection for large underprivileged parts of our society. It has exposed, along with many other things, the issue of extreme and growing social inequality. One of the things that we absolutely know, but we're unwilling to confront, is the contradiction that exists between our absolute commitment to growth and the explicit damage that this has on the environment. This period of suspended animation gave us a practical chance, is giving us a practical chance to reconsider growth as the motivator and justification of everything. The spiral of consumption and leveraging of costs forces us into an inevitable need to sell more, make more, consume more. This flies in direct competition with our need to protect and give more value to our resources and to our environment. Through this period of confinement, we have found a way to discuss and consider the challenges of globalism and growth, not from a negative, not from a solely negative point of view, but in a re reconsideration of what we need as opposed to what we want. What is at hand as opposed to what is out of reach? What is the nearest, what is the nearest to us seems all of a sudden more enticing. At the same time, it has been an opportune moment to take stock of the environmental and social fallout from excessive tourism. What previously seemed unstoppable has stopped. The center of our cities that have been hollowed out by tourism and retail seem like places that might become ours again. Decisions that we didn't seem possible to make have been made for us. Museums themselves are clearly dependent and reliant on tourism and they are under pressure to grow for commercial as well as pragmatic reasons. In itself, this cannot be criticized. To improve the way that work is shown, to put more of the collection on display, to increase the quality of the offer to the visitor, to bring more people into confrontation with art is a concern that should not be dismissed. However, perhaps it is a moment when the spiral that forces every evaluation of museum performance to be based on visitor numbers can be reconsidered. Over the last years, the cultural sector has found it necessary, necessary and has been relatively successful in communicating that it is good for the economy. And in doing so, it has become slightly entrapped by this measure. Cultural institutions and activities shouldn't need commercial justification. Of course, every city is happy when culture becomes a major player in its identity and in its economy. Normally, this evaluation is closely based on the tourist economy. And we are starting to understand the effects of tourism are not all good. At least. Um, excessive tourism. Looking beyond lucrative business, many cities are now being forced to consider its effects on the quality of life of those who work and live there. With this in mind, museums also have to consider their core priorities, especially in terms of audience. We know, for example, that the visitor demographics of many museums show less than 30% of their visitors are local. In recent years, museums have really stepped up in playing a wider role, maintaining their relevance in a society of conflated values. They have demonstrated their role as social as well as cultural infrastructure in our contemporary society. Moreover, they have often served as a much needed space to question, discuss openly and reflect. If, however, I'm forced at this moment to make a statement about the future of museum architecture, and I, I can only consider that museums are going to have to do what we all must do. Make more from what we have, be more flexible and more resourceful. Clearly they should expand programs of engagement and dialogue. Most importantly, they should leverage their independence and their authority in today's climate. We need it more than ever. From the perspective of architecture, Surprisingly, I'm advocating to build less, build lighter, reuse, 
refit and adapt. Be more innovative with the spaces and buildings you have. Be more rooted in the immediate context and society around you and expand your visions as far as possible, but take care about enlarging your real estate. Thank you very much. Welcome, welcome dear participants. It's beautiful to have you with us on the fourth day of the Martin Roth Symposium. Today we're talking about museums and architecture and we are happy to have Pietje Kurger with us, Artistic Director, Fondation, Fondation Vincent van Gogh, uh, whose print you already saw, and Bill Sherman, Director of Warburg Institute and Professor of Cultural History at the University of London is also with us. He will be our first responder for this deep dive. My name is Fabian, and I will guide you through the deep dives today. It's a pleasure to have you with us. And I would like to explain to the audience how you can actually participate in this deep dive session, because this is the time to ask your question. And there are three ways to include them in this discussion. The first one is via direct audio in this webinar. So please click on the raise your hand icon, which you can find in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. As soon as it is your turn, I will call you by name and enable your audio. Please unmute yourself so you can ask your question. As soon as you have asked it, we will turn off your audio again and your video will never be used. If you prefer, you can also ask the question in writing in the chat of this webinar or you use our online form at campus.re-publica.com, campus.re-publica.com if you are following from a website or through YouTube and we can include those questions as well. So if you have a question, please feel free to send them already. And we have little time. So I would ask Bill to give first insights and a first reaction to Bitche's sprint. Thank you. Really happy to do it. And Bitche, so happy we could be here together to pick up this conversation that we started thanks to Martin about three, four years ago now. Uh, as you said, Martin, uh, you met in Venice and uh, we met in Venice because we worked together on the pavilion co-curated by the V&A where I was working then and the Venice Biennale. You were brought in, of course, to uh, curate that 2017 pavilion and you brought the amazing Jorge Pardo to us, who strikes me as such a perfect example of what you were talking about in your sprint earlier. Uh, an artist really who is as much an architect as an artist who thinks of the two uh, as inextricably linked. And I think uh, he's probably the first person who I think of now uh, after Martin uh, when I listen to your sprint. Let me just offer a couple of, of quick thoughts uh, before we hand over to the audience and see if we can uh, pick up some of these uh, many issues you raised. There were so many different topics. Um, the first thing is just to go back to this uh, pavilion that you curated uh, in 2017 in Venice with Jorge. Uh, we thought, as you remember, about doing a summer school together, which never happened, which I still think we should do, unfinished business. And it was about the relationship between museum, biennale, house and shop, and the idea of uh, displaying similar collections in those different spaces. Uh, how they mean differently and how those spaces uh, inform the display and interpretation of work. Um, I think that was a, a really nice example. And again, as I say, something that we should pick up. But what strikes me now in retrospect, and as I think about the uh, uh, ideas you just shared with us a minute ago, uh, I think it's interesting to think about how different spaces uh, shape uh, the work we do and the thoughts we do. And, and it's very unusual, I think, for someone uh, to have such a broad career as you've had in working in spaces, of course, museum, but also Biennale and also magazine. And in a way, I wonder each of those is a kind of architecture, it has its own architecture. And architects, of course, have to build many different kinds of buildings. But we in the museum world tend to work uh, with a fairly narrow, as you said, the white box archetypally, in a fairly narrow set of spaces. And I think you've really broken out of those spaces 
in the different contexts in which you have curated. So it'd be very interesting uh, to hear if you curate architecturally differently in those different contexts. Um, the last thing I just want to say uh, before maybe uh, asking the, the audience for their questions is um, that when you talked about that uh, idea of breaking beyond the white uh, cube and in particular of an, an expanded art history uh, that you're eager to explore, the person, of course, who I thought about was uh, another mutual friend, A.B. Warburg. And A.B. Warburg, of course, I think about partly because I'm director of the institute that carries his name and holds all of his material, but also because I've just returned from Berlin where we have just opened a collaborative exhibition with Haus der Kultur in der Welt, AKW, uh, curated by Roberto Ort and Axel Heil, which reconstructs A.B. Warburg's most infamous project for the first time since 1929, his famous Bilder Atlas, this incredible breaking uh, of a linear style-based art history. And I think those uh, projects in those contexts really made me think because Warburg is maybe the quintessential or, or even the foundational instance uh, of someone who is trying to work across this expanded art history. But there are two other aspects maybe that um, we think about here. The first uh, that are relevant to the symposium and to the, the issues that everybody is raising. The first is global, the need to move beyond single cultures. And I think your uh, examples of the engagements, uh, let's say, bringing in Sun Ra to a Van Gogh exhibition, amazing, uh, really, really great. But again, A.B. Warburg's interests were, were very much in that in that area. But the Hakabe exhibition, which I hope you will see and I hope everybody else will be able to see despite uh, the problems with travel at the moment. What's so interesting about it is its shape in some ways. And it's really what surprised me, even though those materials were from my own institution, I was shocked to see them arrayed in these beautiful curves and the architectural display of these visual panels and the visual information really made me realize that Warburg is an architectural thinker as much as a, a nonlinear art historian. And so I was thinking this building that he built to house them in Hamburg where he had this beautiful uh, oval shaped or elliptical reading room. This reading room that he built in the, in the Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek in, in Hamburg uh, is quite an extraordinary shape. And it made me think, what does the shape of the building uh, have to do with the work that the eye or the mind does in encountering the work of art? So these were my initial thoughts uh, about uh, your really rich presentation. But mostly, I just wanted to say thank you for coming and sharing your experiences with us. And so nice to be back in touch. Yes. Hello, Bill. And uh, thank you for these warm, wonderful uh, memories. And uh, um, yes, I'm happy to uh, see you here on screen again. And. Uh, Mm, I don't know if I should respond or if we open up to the questions. I uh, might quickly uh, uh, respond to, to Abby Warburg because um, also, of course, it, it, it's so connected to Martin Roth and uh, to uh, cultural science. And today, I think, uh, especially in in this uh, closed, a bit closed universe of con of the contemporary art world, um, it's good to to uh, open up. I think to um, to a broader view on uh, on uh, cultural uh, studies as as uh, they have become. Uh, discussed anyway uh, a lot in the uh, last uh, decades and um, Martin Roth was a uh, descendant from this famous Tübinger school which uh, I just want to uh, remind you Volkskunde was uh, the his discipline the discipline uh, he studied and uh, the name was changed into uh, Kulturwissenschaft after the war because it was so loaded uh, 
because it was had been so ideologized and instrumentalized by the Nazis. And I think um, this is this point of view to culture that you have to bring in all different uh, other disciplines, psychology, sociology, and uh, politics uh, to uh, then still have maybe a, a rather neutral um, um, glance on, on the whole panorama and then start to work. And I think uh, this is uh, what uh, Martin Roth, I think, offered to us also from, from the uh, more um, defined art uh, museums to open up and be bold and look at contemporary <coughs> sorry contemporary culture um, yes and can I jump in here just for a little time. for a question by the audience because I think it fits quite well to what you just said Felix asked through our online tool at campus.republica.com in the last days, we talked a lot about museums opening up and getting rid of their physical representation. Do you think there is a way for architecture to help in that process? Uh, sorry, I did acoustically. Uh, uh, the architect should help in which process? And we, talk, uh, we talked in the last days, we talked a lot about museums eventually having to open up and getting rid of their physical representation. So can architecture help in that process? Oh, yes, absolutely. And I, I uh, was very happy to listen to David Chipperfield saying um, in a very humble way, you should, you should uh, um, build less, uh, maybe uh, use more simplicity also, and um, to go to come back to, to Bill's uh, uh, question also uh, to me, uh, asking me about uh, curating architecture, uh, architecturally uh, in different spaces. That means also in the magazine space, in, in the space of a book, uh, as much as in a in a specific uh, space. But I think um, what is interesting now is that. Uh, the corona, the pandemic has uh, shown that the big, big museum, the uh, mega museums in mega cities, they are much drama more dramatically affected by this than the smaller ones in um, off center spaces, places. And um, I think uh, maybe this is a, a moment where they can, the big ones can uh, go and look a bit uh, <laughs> off center from the small and learn a bit from the small ones how to also make attractive uh, programs and uh, not only thinking about big masses and big public and big investments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have another question coming in um, by Simone, who is asking how can architecture help to give space to the unexpected and the surprising? Um, yes, um, I think this is very much related to a very local uh, perception. Every architecture is built on a specific uh, uh, space and this is um you know if if we talk that so many institutions just think about tourists uh, of course you can become very uh, folkloristic and uh, and uh, this is not what i mean i think um you have to you have to address um the public uh at at the uh, a space where, at the place where you build, but at the same time, you have to have a, um, a ho the horizon very open, and uh, uh, that is then the the uh, surprise you can offer. Is, do you have a, an answer to that as well, Bill? Would be 
Yeah, I was actually wanting to jump in there because one of the things that Martin was so obsessed with is how to get people to look at what is not on view or what they don't already know and already want to see. And I think this is something that, again, A.B. Barbrook's entire library, entire photo take was uh, devoted to, was taking you to something that you don't know. And search engines, of course, much less these great, beautiful structures of museums with their sequential rooms and clear maps, they're really the opposite. They take you to the familiar. And what a good museum, library, uh, website, uh, brain does is it surprises you. It takes you to what you don't know and don't even know how to look for. And I think this is one of the things that Vice has done with a sense of surprise uh, as a curator, but also that a great architect can do even in helping us to get lost. I remember just quickly, the last thing is that the VNA is an extremely notoriously difficult uh, museum to navigate. And while I was there, we went through several unsuccessful attempts to have a new map uh, made for the institution. And at the end, I think everybody felt comfortable with people just getting lost because wandering sometimes, uh, not knowing your way is one of the best ways to find your way. Well, for me, that's a great ending to this deep dive. And um, thank you so much, Beecher, for taking the time to answer the questions by the audience. It was really wonderful to have you with us. It was a very refreshing look. So a warm digital applause to you. And many thanks also to Bill Sherman, our first responder, Pleasure. who will leave us at this point as well. And also thanks for the nice invitation to the Haka Wee. Well, I, me as a Berliner will certainly go now. Good. So <laughs> next up is the deep dive, deep dive with David Chipperfield and Edwin Heathcote, which will begin in one minute on this very channel. And thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you back in one minute. So welcome back to your participants to the second deep dive of this day. We are very happy to have you with us. And it's a great honor for me to give a warm welcome to David Chipperfield, architect, founder of David Chipperfield Architects, London, Berlin, Milan, and Shanghai, and to Edwin Heathcote, architect, designer, and journalist, who are now with us for the second deep dive. We are very happy to have them with us. And we are very happy that they take time to answer your questions. So just to remind you, there are three ways to include them in this discussion. If you wanna, wanna ask your question through audio, you can participate by clicking raise your hand on the bottom of your screen. You can also ask your question by writing in the chat of this webinar, or you use our online forum at campus.re-publica.com. If you are following from a website or YouTube, then we can also include those questions. So let's dive in. I would ask Edwin to give a short insight and a short reaction to David's sprint. Thank you. And thank you so much, uh, David, for a talk which uh, exquisitely captured the contradictions and the paradoxes which, um, which define the world of contemporary museum architecture. 
Uh, this, it seems to me, is also very much the world of Martin Roth, uh, who tried to tread the sometimes uh, a wobbly line between the popular and the and the highbrow. The museum is a, a public forum and a civic space, and there's a place in which to ask the difficult questions of how uh, how the world came to be as it is, uh, and those questions are not avoided. How did we acquire all these treasures and this wealth? Um, Martin uh, was always amused by the, um, the the idea at the V&A that the curators were called keepers, as if their job was to, to keep the, the, the objects and not to show them. And, and in fact, as uh, Bill Sherman just said in, in, in the talk earlier, um, you know, it's one of these places that's very easy to get lost in, but getting lost is, is part of the charm. The building kind of works against you, but with, uh, with your... Um, induction into a broader culture. Um, talking of architecture, as we are, I think we could uh, easily make the case that museums have been the vehicle for architects to impose themselves on, on cities uh, and for architecture as a discipline to raise its profile. So museums have used architecture and architects have used museums, whether it's Frank Gehry's Bilbao Guggenheim or the Herzog de Mouron's Tate Modern. Uh, there has been this huge um, expansion, and, and as you mentioned, the kind of uh, the, the the absorption of the of the mega museum into a kind of uh, global tourist itinerary, which is questionable in in in, in its effects on the city. And Roth himself was was part of this expansion, overseeing the uh, the addition of the new space at the V&A in Kensington, in East London as well, even Shenzhen. Um, and I'm fascinated that you warn against expansion. I know, I know that you're a, you're a, a, a kind of a, a, a modest and honest architect, and you see the um, you know you see that this is not an unalloyed good thing that that, that these buildings are um, are being used in this way as kind of boosters for cities. So if, if museums now are going to be crippled by the effects of COVID and the lack of funds that results from it, by the, the effective temporary end of the blockbuster shows and mass tourism, what role, I wonder, do architects have to play in the immediate future of the museum? Uh, is this the end of the cultural spectacular, the blockbuster? Do they need to find another outlet for their fantasies? Or are their skills conversely possibly needed even more now? Uh, if if museums are going to have to try and do more with less. Anyway, your talk, I think it raised all these issues. I hope we might uh, begin to cover them in a little more detail in this um, deep dive. Can I uh, go over and um, see what questions we have? Yeah, we have one question already coming in from the audience um, by Giovanna, who was asking through our chat. Um, she, First of all, she wanted to thank you. So thanks for the talk that expressed the uncertainty of the current situation so well. You mentioned building less and being more innovative with the space we have. Can you give us an example of what that could mean in practice also for the museum sector? Yeah, well, I'll try. Um, obviously, having built my fair share of museums, it's much easier for me to advise that um, you know, we don't need to build so many. I mean, it's slightly, I'm aware of the hypocrisy in what I'm saying, but um, I suppose that it goes back to the, the, the general condition that I think we're all having to reconsider, which is question growth as the, the, the motivator of so much of what we do. Um, and uh, clearly museums have been uh, are in a sort of um, spiral where they, in for very good reason and very sincerely, have, I think, in the most fascinating way, as has been said all afternoon, um, you know, changed their program from a sort of static one to a dynamic one, that to become more relevant, to think about uh, outreach through education, through, um, and, and obviously, there's a certain chicken and egg in that, which is to do with attracting more, you know, getting more visitor numbers, which is, uh, museums have a lot of pressure to do. But uh, I would say societally, we have in the last years um, assumed a sort of economic situation, which is based on leveraging and uh, optimizing, maximizing 
uh, everything. And um, clearly, I think we're at a moment where we have to reconsider that. And and museums the same as, as as anything else. And so, obviously, this goes counterintuitively because what's happening, for instance, is that art is becoming more and more valuable. And as it becomes more valuable, you have to protect it more. And as it becomes more protective, you have to have the buildings have to become more protective. But just at the point when one would like to have a slightly more informal uh, relationship to art and the architectural spaces or settings for art might gravitate to the more informal. I mean, you see that in the Venice Biennale, for instance, the, the charm of work shown in a much more informal. Contradicting that is the fact that art is becoming expensive and the people that uh, are concerned with it, are more and more cautious about the, the environment. So I think there are opportunities, but I think these have to be really, um, you know, tackled in a, in a very profound way. It's not something that architects can do, but we can certainly help in the process. Can I ask something? We, we as people in architecture and in culture and museums, we often ask, can the museum become a, a more civic place? Can it be a place of gathering and a social space and so on. But in certainly in the UK and in, in, in the kind of Anglo-Saxon world, we're seeing an erosion of the, the infrastructure of public buildings that we used to have, whether it's post offices or town halls or working men's institutions, education, adult education, all these kinds of places which used to provide a public forum. I know that Kieran Long, when he was at the VNA, he tried to uh, he tried to set up voting booths for the general election in the VNA. Uh, you know, he said, "Well, you know, we we claim to be a public building. Can we really be a, a piece of public infrastructure?" And then it turned out that they couldn't use it because people would have to walk too far to get to the booths, which had to be in a particular place in the museum. So it, it turned out to be uh, impossible because there were too many uh, kind of regulations in place. But I wonder, in a in a world in which that kind of public infrastructure is disappearing. Can we make the, can we integrate the museum more into the public sphere? Oh, absolutely. And, and I think it's, it's both, as you ind indicate, a reaction to a sort of negative condition that we have less and less territory, which is independent of uh, commercial pressures or yeah. other, Pressures. I mean, so much public space in London is not really public space. It's a sort of extension of retail mm. environment. Um, and clearly during COVID, I think we all understood the importance of sort of neutral, real public space, not um, simulated public space. But certainly as social infrastructure, museums have, have understood that. They've understood that they uh, offer territory, uh, yeah. intellectual and physical. Uh, and that combination is, is very very rich of course when we talk about museums you know it's a bit like talking about animals i mean a dog is not quite the same as a cat when it's not the same as a as, a, as an elephant um the the conditions of a, of a large national museum are different to a regional museum and my experience in in america for instance in in smaller regional uh cities and museums is that the the museum takes on a critical and very important um, uh, role within the community. Yeah. And that's why I, I'm nervous that the tendency for museums to be sort of semi-confiscated by mayors and uh, investors uh, to say that, uh, you know, a museum will bring more people and is part of that type of, mm. uh, you know, I mean, it, we had it in Wakefield, it was always said, well, it will bring more people or in turn, I mean, yeah, they will possibly if you do it well, but first of all, you've got to want museums. So I think we've got to be very careful that um, to disentangle the the, econ the potential economic attraction. And of course, since Guggenheim Bilbao, um, there's hardly a mayor in any city in the world isn't attracted to the notion that their economy could do better if they had a iconic building. But my concern is that if this is a contradiction, because if you want to improve museums as so, social infrastructure, the social that they are infrastructuring has to be local. And Can if I we get to a situation... And include another question by the audience. 
Um, Samantha wants to ask her question uh, through the audio function. So please unmute your mic and you can ask your question. Hello, Samantha. Hi, hello. Thank you so much for a great discussion. I am a recent uh, graduate from the architecture school, Columbia GSAP in New York. And um, I'm following up, uh, I'm very interested in museums and I have visited ARL two weeks ago and Foundation Van Gogh and also I went to see a, uh, up, uh, the under construction Luma uh, tower. So um, it reminded me a bit of uh, Bilbao effect. And I was wondering what is your impression of the whole project and how it relates to Van Gogh. And on a separate note, I would like to ask you about uh, Mr. Chipperfield uh, on your uh, opinion about scale and importance of scale of a museum, especially now when we see that we need to reserve a time slot at the Guggenheim to see, let's say, the countryside exhibition. And on the other side, smaller museums are open to public and there are no restrictions. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question. I would just give you the floor. Eddie, are you going to reply to the No, first? no, that's for you. That was for you. I think yeah. that's all for you. Um, <laughs> well, I think in, in, in a way, the question about how continues um, the conversation in the sense that, you know, first of all, opening a museum anywhere and promoting culture anywhere under any circumstances is a good thing. You know, so that that's a that's a given. Then then the question is, um, you know, a, a find a more granular discussion within under that umbrella. Um, I do think that we have to be careful that art and culture isn't used as an extension of the sort of tourist economy, because I think at the same time, we're understanding that the tourist economy is, has distinct disadvantages and, and negatives. And I think that clearly the museums, the, the role that we are fascinated about in museums is, is in, a, in a sense what Eddie, you, you raised earlier, you know, to what degree is a museum part of social infrastructure, as well as um, you know a cultural destination, and I think that that is a, is a growing project. And clearly, it depends on you being relevant to the community as much as it does to to tourists. And, and certainly in Berlin, when we built the James Simon Gallery recently, I would say the purpose of that building in a nest of other national museums was to uh, be an offer to the to people in Berlin as much as, as anybody else by the fact it's got a lecture hall and it's got um, you know, amenities which the this, um, citizens of Berlin might. And that's, that is an, an issue for every museum. It's a sort of you know, um, paradox that they need to attract larger groups. But on the other hand, how do you ensure the demographic split is somehow healthy? Mm. So thank you very much. Maybe Edwin, you can also give, give us a short insight on how museums can attract more local people instead of being as touristic as David just pointed out. Well, I think um, uh, Biche Kudiger uh, in a talk earlier made a very interesting point uh, that the, the big blockbuster economy of art has come to a screeching halt. It's stopped pretty much entirely now. There's no future really for the huge shows, which cost a lot to mount and rely on huge visitor numbers. But at the same time, the, the provincial, you know, forgive me using the word provincial, I don't like it, but it, it, it's an easy word. The, the provincial museums, which are smaller and are not geared to mass tourism, but rather to community events, to education, to maybe young emerging artists or local artists, amateur artists uh, even they're they're probably going to flourish i i would expect i would suspect now and i think uh, you know david has worked on both scales here with the margate um the turner and uh, and and the, uh, the museums here at the museum island in berlin um and i think it's it's very interesting that the that for a long time now our focus i think has been on the big blockbusters on tate modern and moma and maybe you know, they'll be there, they will always have a place, but maybe the, their time as the kind of vanguard is is over. And maybe, you know, we need to look to the, the smaller institutions, which can be more nimble because they don't have such huge staffs to maintain. I think I think it's a, it, it's actually a rather encouraging future because those those 
institutions are probably more embedded in an actual community and social life. I think that the last point we should make, and we, in a way we should complement the contemporary art world, is it takes a lot of kicking at the moment for all of the, the strange things that come out of this um, slightly overhyped community. On the other hand, contemporary art has really worked hard to, to be relevant. I mean, through the things that Peter said, you know, I mean, dealing with with social and political issues, as well as environmental issues, issues of, of gender and issues of culture. And, and I think that that has really um, changed the, the dynamic in terms of the com communication of, of, of knowledge and information, as opposed to just presentation. And I think, um, therefore, contemporary art museums have, a, have, in some sense, have an easier role than if you're presenting Chinese porcelain. Um, uh, because it's not quite so easy to turn, you know, ceramics into something rare. But on the other hand, I think what's interesting is that the contemporary art attitude has somehow filtered into the more scientific and historic museums where they are thinking about their collections in those social and political frames. And I think that's also where the whole thing is becoming quite fascinating. So Thank you so much uh, for your time, David Chipperfield, for taking the time to answer the question, also to go in a direct dialogue with the audience. So thanks to our participants. It was a Thank pleasure you. to have you with us. Also to have Edwin Heathcote with us, who will be with us for the next deep dive with Louisa Hutton as well. So uh, you're about to see her sprint, and then you have to, then you're going to see David Ajaya's sprint. I hope you enjoy the program, and I look forward to seeing you in the next deep dive at 6.30. Thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. I'm Louisa Hutton, an architect. I'm in partnership with Matthias Saarbrook and others and have been in Berlin for 27 years, always with a foot in London. 
and we've built three museums. I first met Martin Rote when he was based in Dresden, and more recently when I was on the jury for the V&A East in Stratford, East London. I much respected his extremely broad understanding of culture, as well as his consideration of the museum as a tool to strengthen civil society. Exhibitions should encourage us to ask important societal questions. Indeed, society, and with it our understanding of democracy and how we live together, seems to be changing faster since Rhodes' death three years ago than even he might ever have imagined. And of course, as our communities transform themselves, so must museums. Read the challenges and opportunities for museums of the 21st century, I will discuss the relationship between the digital and the tangible. And in this, the power that architecture has in the creation of physical place and particular aura. Monica Grutters, the Secretary of State for Culture and Media here in Germany, reminded us recently that democracy is not a possession, but an achievement that should be continually defended. Indeed, it needs non-stop artificial respiration. I quote roughly, the freedom of art provides the life oxygen that is necessary for democracy. Art and culture are not just distractions from our everyday realities, but form an indispensable part of our individual, as well as communal, confrontation with our human existence, giving us an indispensable tool when we think about what it means to be alive. This is even more salient at times such as these when the fragility of our collectively held certainties is suddenly exposed. And now, three months later, finding ourselves still deeply immersed in all the uncertainties that COVID-19 brings us, sorry, COVID-19 brings us, worries that Grutters fittingly compared to the paralyzing anxieties of the migrants in Petzold's 2018 film, Transit, we are all fully aware that it's not just the individual experience of art and culture that is important, but rather the collective participation in concerts, talks, exhibition visits, and cultural visits of all times. For the individual experience of culture can, to a certain degree, as we've all found out, be made virtually as we escape the narrowness of our own being through our screens and search engines, as well as books, of course. But the collective experience illustrated, of course, perfectly by today's Zoom symposium, that when pronounced in German, sounds as if the Greeks might have already thought of it as a Zoomposium, although, of course, the wine drinking and with it, the conviviality remains sadly virtual. And as we miss, crucially, contact with each other, humans are social creatures, we thrive on exchange. Of course, it is always a pleasure to visit an exhibition alone, to have the place to oneself, to be able to even more fully immerse oneself into the subject matter, engaging with ideas that may be totally new to one or shown in a new light. But museums are also places of encounter with other people. They do not merely provide opportunities for dialogue with the exhibits. They supply meeting places for both formal and informal gatherings that are free of commercial pressure through all sorts of events and activities, including increasingly programs for both adult and children's education. So each museum provides its own physical experience, its own specific atmosphere. This is a totally non-translatable, not possible to mediate authentic encounter that takes place either through one's personal involvement with any particular artwork, possibly in an intimate setting, or as a coming together with others by chance or design in the exhibition gallery, the lecture theater, the cafe, or any other social space. So it is the physical stuff of buildings that provides the backdrops for this sustenance of our individual and collective identities. And it's therefore the specific qualities of museum architecture that supplies us with memorable atmospheres, that is with corporeal experiences that become literally embedded in our bodies and so, and so stay with us for a long time, as opposed to the fleeting nature of the digital experience. Museums are public places, spaces and places, indivisible parts of the public realm. Now that they have been clearly knocked off their 19th century pedestals, they should be as accessible as possible, that is highly visible in their respective cityscapes with welcoming entrances and other outside-inside places before the exhibition or event spaces start. 
In this respect, I have the lovely triple Turkish observation that Neil McGregor, who includes free entry, as I do, into the question of accessibility, that he made in a public conversation about her Brandhorst Museum, Museum in Munich. His point was that for a museum that happens to be located on Turkish Street and that hosts the fantastic series of 12 panorama paintings by Twombly of the Battle of Lepanto, the last hand-fought sea battle in the late 16th century between Christians and Ottomans, should be freely accessible and indeed inviting to all Turks of Munich and elsewhere. A second example is London's Royal Academy, where the success of the new entrance at Burlington Gardens by David Chipperfield, whose nice informality, when compared to the august courtyard of Burlington House's Piccadilly entrance, has changed the way that the RA can operate and is perceived, particularly by its young audience. This welcome in the city should ideally be linked to an external public space of some generosity and amenity, where people can gather or just hang out without need for consumption. And there should be a synergetic relationship between such an outside place and the spaces and activities of the museum itself, each mutually reinforcing the other. Regarding the experience of the museum itself, there are the spaces for encountering people that should be low threshold, ideally open outside museum hours, while those spaces for encountering art must allow a focus of intention attention. Unlike our digital screens, where with ever-creasing impatience we swipe information away to find something newer, more tantalizing. Regarding this offer of focus, one should aim for an intimacy in personal encounter with the artifact. One thinks of, the Lina, Mo of Lina Bobardi's Maspa in Sao Paulo, where the visitor was directly confronted with the artwork on individual glass walls, or of Taniguchi's wonderful museum in Tokyo's Ueno Park, or indeed Scarpa's Castle Vecchio. So my first question, to what extent should the architecture of the museum be particularly expressive in the often already cacophonous urban realm? In our digitally dominated era, does it need to be more expressive than possibly was necessary or desirable to date, so that you would easily remember the building, whether you see it in real or virtual space? And is such memorability just for the benefit of marketing and branding, as opposed to aiding one's own memory of which exhibition one has seen? It should, of course, not be willful for, for attention's sake. A museum's architectural expression must relate to its content and make sense in the city, as for any building. My second question, will we need to conceive the interior architecture, its organization, materiality, and its photogenic qualities anew in a world dominated by the screen and virtual museum visits? And what are the implications of social distancing? As COVID-19 continues to instruct that our much cherished contact with one another is denied, can the physicality, the aura, the spirit of architecture with its light, with its texture, with its hapticity provide some sort of solace? To conclude, I find that the traditional pairings, oppositional pairings of analog versus digital, local versus international or global, can be turned into opportunities. Now we can have both, the actual, I would say the authentic, and the virtual. So we should exploit the, exploit the benefits of these together. Unlike the digital, though, architecture takes time to commission, plan, and build. Lastly, as museums offer a broadening of our horizons, an expansion of our consciousness of this earth and our particular place within it, so museum architecture should contribute to our curiosity about the world and how we can each contribute to it. To do this, museums need to continuously reinvent themselves, just as we do as individuals, adapting to life as it unfolds. They need to attract ever and new and ever younger audiences being aware of their responsibility as places of education and democracy. I look forward to your questions, any questions you may have in the deep dive to come. Hello, everyone. Um, today, I'd like to really make a presentation about the evolution of uh, museum architecture and also to look at the emerging museum architecture that's happening in the 21st century, but also specifically how it's going to impact the continent of Africa. 
our traditional beliefs about museum collecting really comes from the sort of the rebirth uh, of interest in the Renaissance um, uh, of the classical world and the, the, the beginning of casts and reconstructions of Greek sculpture that was being kind of brought together by Roman, Roman collectors and Roman families to dignify their homes and their spaces, right through to the idea of imagery. I love this image as a kind of way to kind of bring that conversation into the fore. And of course, um, with this, you know, in sort of during the Enlightenment, the, the notion of collecting and of being worldly and being able to understand the natural world as well as the, 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 the anthropological and archaeological world became incredibly important. And the best sort of spaces for uh, that had that data and that information really started to search in their knowledge and their 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 ability to 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 have this knowledge and to to disseminate it amongst their people and their populations of course this moved as wealth built in the west um, into the uh the sort of renaissance in the visual arts and the performing arts all the arts in fact and right up to the sort of 18th century we're then looking at an explosion of uh, representation, which then fills palaces and 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 churches and and extraordinary spaces, and becomes a kind of salon style to deal with the sheer quantities of these works uh, in these private institutions. Of course, probably at the beginning of in the 19th century, the sort of first real museum exhibition is probably the Great Exhibition in 1851 where a purpose-built structure is made to really create a public forum, a public, a real, truly public space that creates the assemblages mostly of colonial conquest and empire and of technological um, advancement and of wealth. So it's a kind of moment of the sort of empires and colonial empires uh, bringing their, their population and their citizens to along with them on this new sort of unfolding power um, in the world and the dominance of their cultures in the world. At the same time that these, um, these expositions are happening, this is the, the reverse image where sacred shrines in places, we will go to West Africa now, like Benin, where these incredible sacred shrines are being the kingdom of Benin is being taken down for its audacity to stand up to the British Empire. And, and the artifacts of these palaces and these homes are then being taken back to be shown to civilizations in the West. These artifacts, which move from sacred shrines, then begin to adorn people's houses and homes and become sort of trophy uh, forms, um, decontextualized, De decontextualized and 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 also without decontextualized from their environment, but also decontextualized from their histories, and become just objects of curiosity, which then start to become ornaments in museums, in homes, in places. In museums, the sort of encyclopedic quality, um, the archival quality of just simply indexing and reducing the 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 detail and the specificity of these materials. Um, becomes even more exacerbated. And they're just indexed as, as almost archeological found objects, just describing their scientific providence, but not their contextual and spiritual or sociological context. This, um, this extraction in relation to the continent is something that um, I want you to reflect on because in a sense, as the evolution of the museum from the model of the Crystal Palace becomes more and more refined, more and more um, decluttered from the sort of palaces of the 18th century um, um, and moves into the 19th and early 20th century with sort of abstract spaces, though the modernist movement bringing abstraction and whitening of the gallery, less objects being placed in, more rooms being required, new palaces of, of museums being required to absorb and understand the works the modernist museum, which is also a reflection on the artifacts of the times past still incubate this analysis to the point that at the end of the um, uh, 20th century, we have a kind of seminal work by Martin Krieg 
where he talks about the lights going on and off in the white cube as the kind of end point of this decluttering or this essentializing of the museum to the point that the space itself becomes the object of conversation. And for me, the counterpoint, which is Kara Walker's extraordinary work in the Domino factory, where she moves out of the space of the white cube and enters the space of an industrial labor space as a kind of reclamation of the relevance of art within society and, and the relevance of art within the social uh, infrastructure of the communities now, or specifically in this, a dying um, labor community um, in Brooklyn, which is no longer um, a factory, but becoming will become a sort of residential unit. For me, this, this moment really uh, speaks to the, 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 the rise really of the museum that we built on the uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture, this museum which was built on the Washington Mall, which takes a new model entirely, a new model entirely. The model is to create a narrative museum which starts to recontextualize not just the objects of some of the colonial tropes or endeavors, but also of slavery specifically and the, the formation of America specifically, and to use the building and its interiors to curate a narrative museum, which starts to allow people to kind of find the sense of themselves within the big project of the formation of nation building, the formation of uh, the world that we live in now in the 21st century. This museum finishes a kind of run of really very much 19th century inspired museums and creates at a counterpoint, a new 21st century museum, which speaks as a, te a teaching beacon and a tool for the democratization of information in the 21st century with the birth of um, uh, the digitization and, and the internet, but also with the shift away from the value of the object as authentic to the recording of experience and the objects that make the experience further enhanced emotionally um, to be of value. Um, and right now, the projects that we're working on um, bring us back to that moment, that image of the sort of British shoulders sort of extracting out of Benin, out of Nigeria in the top corner, the orange being the sort of the, the British uh, relationship to the continent of Africa pre the Berlin division. And the ideas of Benin City, an extraordinary um, world monument, which is now recognized as a world heritage city, if we could have seen it, with an extraordinary network of um, walls, which created an, a complex idea of how a city organization could work. Our thinking is in this context to try and see if we can construct the notion of the museum um, as a reteaching tool of the lost stories of the colonial extraction that created the museums in the West, but uh, um, excavated the knowledge base of the cultures of West Africa or the colonies from their, from their communities. Here's looking at a diagram where we are looking at the, the restoration of the walls, the restoration of the spaces in front of the palace grounds, the definition and the identification of that, to then place within that an idea of making a construction making a new type of museum where it's not about the, the spoils, but about reconstructing memory. Um, it starts with looking at some of the royal enclosures and the, and the drawings of soldiers of how the city looked with its extraordinary orthogonal walls and its courtyard networks. It looks at some of the visual photography which was taken and the ruins which are now of uh, these spaces without their artifacts and without their communities lost from their context and to see if we can create um, a new kind of uh, museum where the, the, the notion of the spaces of the inhabitation of these forms are then reconstructed as pavilions that allow the recontextualizing of these artifacts now that we're in discussion about restitution or reconstructions that can allow the communities that are in Africa to understand their heritage and that becoming a model of 21st century architecture on the continent. Um, and also as a way to create a relationship between the extraction that has happened in the West uh, to those museums and to understand a new model of museum building, which is required on the continent 
and an end elsewhere that is outside of the context of the Western model. So these are um, really thinking about the idea of the museum as a place of reconstruction and a place of remaking, re, remaking memory, lost collective memories. So in, these are just images of the, 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 the proposition of the, um, um, of the Benin Museum. And then immediately one might believe that this is a traditional museum, but this is looking at the restitution and the objectification that happens in the West and then full reconstruction where artifacts are replaced within context and storytelling enacted to re-allow the citizens and also visitors to understand the magnitude and the importance of these civilizations and, these, and the context of these objects which have been decontextualized. The notion of gardens which are symbolic and the notion of the form of the building being made from the matter that you know, is referencing the walls of the city and the construction types of the cities and the relationship of this institution back in the royal compound and how it could make a relationship to the city and to the community that will um, receive this eventually. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm uh, currently uh, speaking from La Jolla, San Diego in California. And um, this year uh, in May 2020, uh, uh, I was scheduled to show a new installation uh, called Three Oceans, uh, or now we call it Hollow Ocean at the Venice Architecture Biennial 2020. And um, basically the, uh, entire concept was on uh, the oceans. So I kind of uh, nickname it as the ocean uh, pavilion for, my, for myself and uh, my team. And um, of course, uh, due to COVID, uh, we couldn't fabricate and then we, we couldn't uh, install the work for 2020. Hopefully it will be, uh, you know, reconsidered, I mean, reinstalled, reinstalled meaning will be installed by 2021 for uh, this coming May. But in short, um, the entire exhibit design was uh, focused on uh, six, uh, let's call it chapters about the oceans. And um, the starting point was really uh, connected to uh, our cultural and uh, financial and uh, a physical and let's say somatopsychological connection to the oceans. Um, I started with the idea that uh, this was from a John F. Kennedy quote actually, that we are water beings. Uh, when a human baby is born, um, uh, her body is 75% water and um, the womb itself is simply a fluid cham chamber, right? Uh, our attachment to water is uh, physical, physiological, psychological, cultural, and this is not a surprise as um, water actually does translate to life, right? That's where uh, the, uh, the life uh, started in ancient oceans again for a billion years ago, yada, yada. So um, I was really focused on this uh, water as a much larger topic, obviously, but also um, uh, the anthrop anthropogenic impact on uh, lakes, oceans, seas, rivers, and the water bodies of this planet, uh, which covers you know most of its surface. And um, I was really this time in the, uh, for this uh, kind of opportunity to make an installation about this. I wanted to uh, focus on you know uh, the most pressing issues. I had experience working with plastic pollution. I think it's been now. 13 years, I've been working on pelagic plastics and plastic pollution, and I took this as an opportunity uh, to basically talk about um, more, right? Because there is more space, I can talk about more. So in short, uh, there are six uh, chapters, and one of them is plastic ocean. So I had these designs that are um, water columns, 
uh, that uh, we are hoping to build with recycled glass or recycled plastic. So they'll be transparent, full of water. And each column is uh, basically an entryway or a gateway to another uh, topic that we're discussing. So uh, I started working on a column for plastic ocean. Another uh, issue that I'm focusing on was uh, acidification. And uh, that's also connected to climate change. So climate change, global warming uh, is another column and it's a systemic impact uh, in world's oceans, right? Uh, overfishing is uh, another issue that I'm talking about in this installation. Uh, specifically, uh, the fact that in the last 50 years or so, 90% uh, of, um, you know, big fish is gone. And just, I'm gonna, not going to read statistics here, but um, there are all these terminology to attach to overfishing, like bycatch, uh, which is basically all incidental catch of uh, non-target fish in ocean wildlife and often discarded at sea. Actually, there's a term for that too. It's called discard rate. So what rate of your uh, basically uh, fishing you're uh, getting rid of that you can't use and that's typically wildlife like, uh, you know, cetaceans, whales, dolphins, and um, marine mammals like uh, sea turtles. And um, so that's another column where we're talking about this. Uh, ghost nets is another term that, you know, I'm highlighting in this installation, which is basically after fishing, overfishing, uh, whatnot, these um, nets, which are also connected to the plastic problem, are discarded in the oceans. And uh, they keep catching fish, um, right? In fact, they're not that ghost. It's more like, you know, they're undying and they keep killing for 500 years or more, right? And um, last but not least uh, was uh, eutrophication right and uh, extinction so eutrophication is another term where um, algae takes over and you know uh, local life just diminishes and dies and uh, the uh, last one is basically really um, looking at how as a cumulative accumulative effect of all of these issues uh, we're losing uh, ocean wildlife so how do you really con convey all of these ideas uh, without being didactic in an architectural setup? My inspiration came from uh, the kelp forests and uh, also some architectural examples I had seen in my early days of architecture, very tall columns, and that was the approach. But when the museum uh, you know, exhibit uh, was canceled, it was going to take place in Giardini Pavilion in one of the larger rooms. Um, and, uh, you know, we're deciding when it will be happening. So I was kind of trying to continue the fabrication, etc. cetera. But um, with COVID, it just made me realize that even if an event like Venice Architecture Biennial, uh, because of its, um, you know, let's say reputation and the number of people it draws is a wonderful platform to convey all these ideas, it's still a limited platform. Because with COVID, I think we have seen this kind of transformation uh, from uh, more uh, local physical experiences to uh, distributed networks and like teleportation, right? Or telepresence, teleportation not happening yet. Sorry, just jumped a couple of hundred years. Uh, telepresence and um, basically all global communications and uh, big operations like education happening online. So. I have always been a big uh, proponent of using uh, exhibition space and museum space as much as museum is muse and inspiration as an educational platform. It's a brain opener, these places. They expand your soul, but they also, uh, you know, um, basically push you to think, right? So I moved the entire project, uh, not that I canceled the physical part, we're still doing details and like looking for the best materials to work with, et cetera. But uh, I have I moved the entire platform to a virtual reality. And um, it was a very easy transition for someone like me. And I believe there are a lot of people in my position where this transition could come very natural and organic. I had already built everything, designed everything. Built is not the right word, but let's call it design. Uh, you know, with vectors and polygons and uh, edges and curves and it was already uh, there in front of me. That's how I interact with the idea right now, even if I start with a sketch 
or um, you know, as an architect, even if I have like a grand vision, the moment I see the site, right, which doesn't necessarily happen because you can't fly to see the site anymore. I had the virtual space in front of me and I had my research about uh, these six chapters. And I, all I had to do was basically take the digital assets and move them to a, a new platform where people could uh, still kind of, uh, you know, um, experience it as a virtual space. So I started virtual space meaning uh, space. And uh, I started thinking about this more and more from also a neuroscientific viewpoint, because of course our physical interaction with architecture determines, I believe, our mood, our emotions, sometimes our thoughts, right? Architecture and ideology, exhibition design and what you want to say with an exhibition uh, is kind of very tightly connected. So how do you take that and either uh, A, replicate that or explore new uh, levels of this uh, in a virtual space. So that's what I've been working on. And um, some of the uh, findings of our, you know, collective research process will uh, be uh, hopefully, uh, uh, you know, released uh, in a couple months before the actual opening date of the Venice Biennial as a, a virtual experience. So I'm talking about a VR headset. But um, another thing that I'm really interested in is that uh, for those who do not have that techno technology available to them, can we still convey this so, uh, experience? So I'm also looking into a web platform where uh, you can uh, visit the architectural space um, uh, using, uh, you know, basically a keyboard and a mouse. So it's like, it's kind of like rediscovering internet in that I'm like, oh yeah, internet can do this because it's just really going back to, I don't know, William Gibson's 1984 and like the beginning of internet where it came at this like a uh, plethora of promises, like you can have an experience, a virtual experience. So what does that mean? It's obviously uh, something that we have to think through because it can't be just pushing buttons or putting images on a virtual wall where you have to walk to the virtual wall to look at the virtual image, right? So to me, that doesn't make sense. And with Hollow Ocean, I'm uh, really, and with my team, trying to understand uh, the, uh, how to say, new possibilities that this environment gives to us. So welcome back, dear participants. Welcome back to the last deep dive for today with Luisa Hutton architect and co-founder of Sarabu Hutton Berlin, whose sprint you already heard, and Edwin Heathcote, architect, designer, and journalist, who you already know from the last deep dive. We are happy to have you with us and that you take the time to answer questions. So thank you both and a warm welcome again. For you as an audience, this is the time to answer and to ask your questions especially. So a short note on how you can do that actually. If you have a question, there are three ways to include them in this discussion. The first one is via direct audio in this webinar. Please click on the raise your hand icon, which you can find in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. As soon as it is your turn, I will call you by name and enable your audio. Please unmute yourself so that you can ask your question. As soon as you have asked it, we will turn off your audio again and your video will never be used. If you prefer, you can also ask your question by writing in the chat or you use our online form at campus.re-publica.com, campus.re-publica.com. If you are following us on our website or through YouTube, we include those questions as well. So you can start to send your question, and I would like to give the floor to Edwin Heathcote for a short reaction on Luisa Sprint. Thank you, Fabian, and uh, thank you, Luisa, for uh, a, a stimulating talk. I was so happy you mentioned uh, Martin Roth's uh, attachment to the idea of um, society in the museum, its interconnectedness with uh, the bigger issues, politics, social and economic life. And I was interested to hear you speak of collective participation as a keystone of, uh, of culture. And the pandemic, of course, has robbed us 
of exactly that collectivity and culture, the theatres, the museums, the um, concerts, the places where we can be part of a crowd participating in a cultural event, which would be nothing without us, where we effectively make the, the culture through our participation. But I was also interested in your framing of this talk as an attempt to reconcile the digital with the physical, the virtual versus the, um, the aura of authenticity in this rather uh, Benjaminian uh, idea of culture where we uh, attend the museum to be in the presence of, of great art rather than in the presence of its mechanical reproduction. Presence in place is everything. I mean, you and I, as it happens, are both in Berlin, but most of the speakers here are, uh, are somewhere else. One of the fascinating things about the experience of this virus has, I think, and when we, we chatted about this earlier, been to underline not only the extent of the digital tools at our disposal, but their fragility and uh, inadequacy. I find a day of uh, Zoom meetings far more tiring than a day of real meetings, uh, in which I'm able to walk from one meeting to another and think in between, uh, in the company of crowds, uh, looking at buildings, at trees, uh, uh, walking down streets. I hope we might be able to address some of uh, some of these questions about place, authenticity and presence uh, in the questions, but I'd better stop and uh, let some of our audience uh, have a go. Yeah, um, we already have the first question coming in. So thank you again, Edwin, for your insights um, by Bernadette, who is asking that we heard a lot about big museums and popular cities. If the financialization of those cities is also a fact, will we see big museums in rural areas on the outskirts of these cities? So, uh, sorry, what is the question? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, will we see big museums in rural areas or on the outskirts of these of these big cities? Uh, yes, I hope so. I mean, in fact, a year, well, a year ago, we completed a museum in Mestre, so most people haven't heard of Mestre, and if, if they have, uh, it's because they know it. It was the service city for Venice. It provided the place from which all the boats left with all the food and clothes and timber for building and all the stone and everything. And uh, Mestre is actually where the Venetians live, but it's um, not where the tourists go. And this museum that we've built is a museum of history, of 20th century history. And it is specifically for the local population. And it has a huge outreach program, the museum, in terms of education and bringing the locals, the Mestrini, into the museum. It may be that visitors to Venice go and visit this museum, but actually I get very moved when I see local people walking through the new civic spaces that we've designed in and around the museum. So for me, it's not just the museum itself that's important and introducing uh, ordinary people and children, everybody to uh, culture with a small C as well as a big C, but also so they can experience uh, places around uh, the museum and feel at home going into the cafe or just walking through the new district that had been closed to the public. So it's somehow, Embedding, embedding the museum in the fabric of the city as a sort of ordinary place. As I, as I said, the museums have been knocked off their pedestals. That's why I like the rear entrance to, to uh, the Royal Academy in London now, which is much more informal than the front. So I think informality, accessibility, outreach are very important and therefore linked to the question is the idea of putting museums in less obvious places, I think is, uh, a very good question and I hopefully these would happen through conversions and using existing buildings, existing structures. Mm. Edwin, maybe it would also be interesting to hear your point or your take on that as you touched that already before in your discussion with David Chipperfield. Yeah, well I think that the, referring specifically to Venice, there's something deeply uh, interesting about what a, a person who lives in Mestre on the mainland, uh, but works in Venice in the most intensely kind of cultural uh, spot in the world, arguably, um, whether they want to kind of escape from culture, whether they have a different kind of culture when they when they um, when they go home. It's a kind of rather odd situation, isn't it? You, you know, I, I know that building from pictures, and it's a it's a it's a very contemporary building, obviously, and I. I wonder actually what you how you build culture for Venetians who've been exiled from their <laughs> hypercultural <laughs> homeland. 
Well, well, actually, there's two two parts of the question, but in terms of what they actually see when they visit or or the object of their visit, apart from hopefully enjoying our architecture, is actually learning about and immersing themselves in the history of the 20th century, which, as we know in Italy, was com uh, very, very turbulent. And in fact, the m museum uh, founders and uh, directors have done that whole museum entirely digital which I find quite extraordinary. I find it quite successful actually. Mm -hmm. And of course the digital generation are the younger ones, the under 16 year olds or the 20 year olds who were born in this century and you know, may get tired seeing old exhibits in, in, a, in a history museum and they can interact with these exhibits. The, the directors can change the museum very quickly. And for us as architects, it's rather beautiful actually because it gives us even more opportunity to make sure that as you walk out of the black box space where everything has been digital and into the architecture, you're even more aware of the power of uh, architecture to create spaces that are completely enjoyable through your senses, through your physical presence, which I said I think is very difficult to mediate on Zoom or in other mm. digital means. If, if the early and mid 20th century left us a legacy of industrial buildings, which we might, you know, which we now mm -hmm. either demolished or reused as either cultural buildings or IKEAs, um, I wonder whether the what, what we will be leaving, so that presumably after this crisis, there will be a, an acceleration of the bankruptcy of particular typologies of buildings. It may well be that this is the end of department stores, for instance, you know, that, I wonder if, or office buildings. Yeah, absolutely, office buildings. And I wonder whether that that is a very fruitful potential uh, uh, future for, for culture, if culture can begin to colonize some of those uh, very central, you know, often very interesting, but and actually quite flexible spaces. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we have a project in Constance in southern Germany mm -hmm. where we're converting a former telecom um, office tower into residences and all over Germany, well, particularly in Berlin, but we need new uh, housing as in England and, and many other places because it's not necessarily because the population is growing, it's because the population is getting more atomized, many more one person households, etc. But I love converting buildings because you, mm. you get something richer in the end because you combine mm. the new with the old. We were talking about this earlier with your work as a mm. conservationist and adding uh, new architecture to old buildings. And for architects, it's a gift of a job. Of course, it's very uh, complex and takes a lot of uh, time and energy, but the combination of new materials with old materials and old spaces, I think is also a way that uh, to enrich people's lives because they come in touch with culture on all levels directly through the physical fabric of the building, whether it's mm. a totally ordinary building, that can be fine too. I like ordinary buildings. Mm. No, absolutely. Yeah. There's another question, which I think it also works quite well with what you just said, uh, which came in through our online tool by Paul. Um, and I think he's also referring to David Ajaya's sprint. How does your museum architecture help to reconstruct memory? And is that even your goal? And I think as you just referred to using former structures, maybe you can also refer how you use this structure in a sense of reconstructing memory in that sort of building process. Well, in fact, the, 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 uh, of course, I'm, I, I'm not David Adjay and I didn't build his museum, but uh, I'll respond in my, in my own way. In the museum in Mestre, in fact, we have converted a 16th century convent that had been out of use for over 100 years. It had been occupied by the military and we've converted that into use as a covered courtyard, covered public space with um, a, a rain covered and sun covered courtyard with the sort of large umbrellas that don't touch the convento. So it's a, an independent new architecture has been put there to enable the, the Mestrini, the locals of Mestre to use this space in a different way to the way they use their main uh, piazza. And for them to be able to rediscover their own culture, their own history by entering this courtyard that has been closed for a hundred years, I think is fantastic. And uh, there could be many other examples I'll talk about, but it's rather difficult without uh, images and uh, over a glass of wine. But I do, I, I, I think um, culture is everywhere. It's a, it's a continuity in our lives. Um, the past is not past, it's actually present. And, you know, every, everything is a continu continuity. I, I, I don't see that things stop and start. 
Um, we're, we're living in times of great change, which is quite extraordinary, but we, we can see uh, that the past is, is part of our lives. And I think when, as architects, we have the opportunity to work with the physical fabric from uh, past uh, generations, past architects, past inhabitants, it can only enrich the present and the future to do that and not to think we always need to create new things and have a tabula rasa, empty site and start, start afresh. It's um, much more interesting and challenging and thought provoking and I, I would say in the end successful to work always with uh, the as found uh, condition in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have about uh, four minutes left. So I would like to include one more question by Giovanna, who was asking that Luisa spoke about the potential of museum architecture to provide solace in this strange period. What sort of architectural or public spaces have you both found solace in, in during COVID lockdown and why? I think, I think that's a very nice question. And thank you, Joanna, for picking up on this rather strange proposition that I uh, put out. I think that architecture, well, everything actually, but architecture happens to be bigger than small objects, but I think have the power to affect us with an A. And, um, and, and it moves us to be involved with other um, being or uh, beings almost almost like people and i think architecture that's very well considered well detailed well thought of that has beautiful materiality that you can touch and see and almost smell and engage as you walk past it because it's very three-dimensional is does have an effect on us and does um more than cheer us up i would say it does also give us solace or consolation it somehow it helps root ourselves in our being we don't live in isolation, we live in this continuous uh, culture, and I think architecture is uh, inextricable and lovely part of it. I have a very short answer for that. Uh, I, I live in a quite a dull neighbourhood uh, in London, and um, I found myself walking, going for a walk every day in the same streets, and actually paying much more attention to the details than I normally would. And the, and the differences, the small differences, the way people have customized their houses, the way everything is slightly different, one house to the next, things that actually seem completely banal, when you, when you look at them more carefully, are actually um, fascinating. They're kind of fascinating insights into the way people live. And I think in a way, it's, it's maybe our, our, our kind of exile into our own, not exile, what's the opposite of exile, imprisonment in our own neighbourhoods in this has actually maybe made us look more closely at, at where we live, which I think is a healthy thing. I think that's a really good answer, Eddie, and I totally agree. I think it's really beautiful to look at the everyday, look at our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. Don't always think you have to find something special because you'll find something special in the everyday. Yeah, yeah it's your own yeah. observation. Yeah, totally. That's a very good answer. And I think it's also a great way to think back of uh, what Beecher said in her sprint of uh, a museum creating the surprising effect. And if you can find that surprising effect in your everyday life, that's also a nice way to discover the positive within this whole uh, Zoom era on this symposium, as you said, Luisa. So um, thank you very much. What I loved with Beecher, I love the quotation of the Van Gogh in the kitchen. That's going to stay with me. I think it's perfect away from the white cube. Van Gogh in the kitchen is perfect. You have an intimate relationship. That's that's great. <laughs> so uh, thank you too for your time and thank for you. your willingness to answer all those questions. Um, no. And also especially thank you to uh, Edwin Heathcote who really doesn't like Zoom environments. Me neither. I hope <laughs> all this is over soon and we can uh, see each other in a crowded place. Unfortunately, <laughs> Sir David Achaya won't be available for a deep dive. So we'll have a longer break this time. The mass program continues at seven, so in about 10 minutes on the streams and on our websites and on YouTube with the Future Forward panel, a look out to museums futures by upcoming museum shapers. Today, our speakers will be the fabulous Pina Yoldas, whose sprint you already saw, will join us from San Diego and Luisa von Zimmermann from Berlin as well. So I hope you have fun with the last panel and thank you for participating in this deep dive. Thank you so much and thanks thank for watching. Thank you very watching. much. Thank you. Bye, Eddie. Bye. -bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.
go. So good evening, everybody. This is Sarah Burke calling from Munich, Germany. And once again, we are ready for a future forward session. Today's talks debated museum and architectures and uh, forward thinking professional Pina Yolders and student responder Luise von Zimmermann will be adding their viewpoints. So wonderful having you, Luise von Zimmermann and Pina Yolders. Um, I hope you're fine, just got up. I guess because of the <laughs> time zones. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much. <laughs> Louisa, yeah. you're also you. fine. Yeah. Yes, I am. Wonderful evening in, in, in Germany, huh? Late summer. So first, let me introduce you to the crowd before we start exchanging views. Louise von Zimmermann completed her BA in architecture at the University of the Arts Berlin and the University of New South Wales, Sydney in 2018, and is uh, currently enrolled in a master program of architecture. And during her studies, she received the Helmut Heinrich Prize as well as a specialized award for the Schinkel competition, of the Schinkel competition. Her projects focus on the architectural concepts of density and in between spaces, as well as the topics of additive manufacturing and game design. Apart from her work in design and programming, she currently works as a teaching assistant at the Chair of Digital Experimental Design of uh, University of the Arts in Berlin. So, and Dr. Pina Yolders, um, works uh, her works develops within biological sciences and digital technologies through architectural installations, kinetic sculpture, sound and drawing, with a focus on post-humanism, eco-nihilism, anthropocene, and feminist techno-science. She lectures as professor of the University of California, San Diego, and is an intra-disciplinary intra architect. Pina Yoldas is, at, uh, is a 2015 John Simon Guggenheim Fellow and a 2016 Future Emerging Arts and Technologies Award recipient. So thank you for being there, for being with us. And um, just let's start with a short uh, sense memory. Um, what kind of buildings do you remember, impressed you, just at little ones, as a child? Do you remember, could you sense back to that time? Is a question for me. <laughs> actually, I think Both one of, of the buildings that uh, thank you that um, impressed you the most was actually a museum, and it was the Louisiana Museum in Denmark. And just this kind of um, not really the building itself, but more the hill outside that I used to roll down as as a kid. So I think that was really this this kind of uh, playfulness that was um, throughout the museum uh, available to me as a child it was really something that I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. That's Pina, where did you grow up? Uh, well, I grew up in uh, Pamukkale, which is uh, the old name for it will be Hierapolis, uh, in the Aegean, inner Aegean part of Turkey. And um, I don't, my dad is an architect, so of course I remember his buildings, and one of which was our home as well. At his office. So, uh, but I think the the um, most uh, kind of memorable moments I spent were uh, in the ancient ruins of the mausoleum of Hierapolis and the amphitheater, because we would go there every weekend, and I would play hide and seek in this ancient city. You could actually walk from one side to the other, and then you had the healing water, which is uh, the Hierapolis. And then the pool, uh, which I loved swimming in. And when you dived into the pool, you would see the columns and the tombstones. So there was, you know, this ancient architecture all around me. And I did, I do think it left an impact on me on terms of scale and tactile memories. Um, but both of you in connection with nature, with landscape, with the impression of, um, you know, the surrounding of, uh, around this building huh? or construction site. 
you could say. So, um, Louisa, now that you're a young professional, uh, could you see, or is there a, like a bridge that you said, I've been following this, or uh, I've been on this and following my past? What is your fascination for architectural concepts like today? Mm, I think, I think this, uh, I used to go there with my family and kind of this sense of community that were, was available at us, to us in that space is something that really um, follows me uh, until today in, my, in the works that I'm interested in, in the works that I do. Um, and I think that's also something that uh, I would take away from the discussions for the past days. That was something that really resonated with me, this idea of um, museums as third spaces and also this places of, uh, of basically human experience and um, communal creation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been just um, ending our talk and uh, it's been a lively one already. So um, we try to get back to this. And um, maybe by bringing in what David Adyai also uh, opened, uh, how he opened his print before with the presentation about the, yeah, to cut it short, the traditional idea of buildings that served as an imagery to understand oneself, um, as to say collectively. Um, and uh, if pal palaces aren't, as he's been pointing out later, um, as maybe palaces aren't adequate for our self-understanding anymore, uh, how should museums transform? What would you say in regard that nation building isn't the essence anymore or might not be the essence anymore, but humanity building is more necessary than ever? What do you think? Go ahead, uh, Louis, yeah, what you. is your thought? Um, I, uh, I mean, if it's a question of how museums should transform, I think it's it's um, the past six months of uh, COVID-19 have been interesting basically to see because I think a lot of museums had to really suddenly transform into something entirely else that, that they weren't necessarily ready for. And um, especially in the digital aspect, I mean, how do you transfer this idea of having uh, a collective experience or a collective memory um, into a digital space. I think that's that's an interesting question that is um, being asked right now. Um, I also believe that, um, as David Chipperfield was saying earlier in the talk today, that maybe I, I, I actually agree with this. That actually, we have to build less. I don't think that we that it's necessary to have these huge monuments and to to um, to use all those materials to attract people from all over the place when in fact that the the museums that uh, that are really working are museums that try to build communities um, uh, locally. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. And um, to add to that, I think um, one other a uh, role of museums, uh, an intrinsic role of museums is uh, their platforms for experiential learning, right? And um, I think we also heard a little bit about the kind of this transformation of the museum uh, from uh, somebody's uh, display or some person's or some power holder's display of, um, you know, their collection of objects of curiosities to, uh, as you just said, Luis, so like a platform for community building. But to me, uh, the most uh, interesting aspect of a museum is that it could really trigger passive learning and experiential learning, because uh, you're learning through space, like that's the whole idea of museum. I always think of museums as a library of, you know, objects and experiences. So um, this role, I think, is becoming more and more important than the fact that this whole event is, let's say, taking place in a you know, Natural History Museum, right, um, together with our own homes, uh, right, uh, is also perhaps indicative of the need for more more places like this where we can learn about, um, let's say, natural world or science, because like we really need to push our um, kind of level of 
uh, how to say knowledge on how uh, certain natural systems are working because I think this is the topic of this century, right? And I think museums are really good uh, starting points for that. But um, again, responding to like how they will be executed, should we build more, etc. I personally don't think that we need to be building more and more museums or we need to build more and more buildings in general. Perhaps we can take built buildings and turn them into museums, like a shopping mall becoming a museum would be fantastic. If that was a disease that spread across all shopping malls like COVID, you know, that would be wonderful. But um, I, I, I really think that we need more platforms for uh, community experience building and um, experiential learning. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the, the point where also digital architecture comes in because it's not taking space. I mean, it takes resources, um, to be honest. It does, <laughs> it, does. it does, and it does. Yeah, please. Oh, yeah, it, it does take a lot of resources, actually. And that's um, something we need to, like, for force, it, it takes, you know, water to run servers. You need to, you know, keep things in the cloud, yada, yada. You need you use a lot of, uh, you know, infrastructural resources to convey a digital experience. There's that. But earlier I heard somewhere that, um, you know, uh, translating uh, what you could experience in a museum to the digital platform uh, you know, is less effort or it, it takes less time to build for digital. It's not true. And uh, of course, it's true that to build a building, especially at the scale of a museum, there'll be a lot of people and contractors and, you know, a lot more money involved. But uh, building for digital world is also something that takes time and effort, right? And a lot of thought. But I do think that that could be a direction given the success of, for instance, social media, uh, streaming services, and uh, gaming during COVID. I don't know if you paid attention, a lot of games like Animal Crossing in the States, uh, you know, everybody was playing them all of a sudden. And people started spending more time in these like digital worlds, uh, you know, you could call it escapism, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? And uh, then if there is this potential, should we not claim this? Should we not pay attention to this as architects, especially at a point where, um, you know, architecture as we've seen or as we've learned in school doesn't really apply to the world we are faced with? Uh, but I, I also would like to hear from Luis as like, you know, a representative of the uh, upcoming generation of architects. Yeah, I mean, um, maybe I'm not the best representative because honestly, um, I, fully, I pretty much agree with what you were saying right now. So I'm kind of doubtful of the occupation that I picked pretty much because I mean, I was, I'm being trained to build and to, um, to think about concepts of, for buildings. But to be honest, I think we should um, much more change it to think about uh, how we actually make space. I think that would be a better mm -hmm. um, expression for it because mm -hmm. space making is something else than building. It's, it's more about um, creating uh, a space for something to happen maybe or for something that, you know, it, it might also just be that the new way of building is not actually um, creating something more but actually just leaving space. And I think that right. could be an interesting, yeah, yeah. And I mean, um, I, I think I mentioned earlier in our talk, um, I remembered uh, this gallery in Sydney, for example, that was just, um, it's called Alaska Projects. That was just a bunch of uh, parking spaces that someone had converted into a gallery and it works as well. So it's not really necessary to mm -hmm. kind of um, rebuild everything that, uh, yeah. Yeah, this perhaps like grand approach. And again, uh, referring to our conversation earlier, this kind of like Faustian uh, gesture to like excavate and explode, you know, because these are the actual terms that um, we come across when we're thinking about especially large scale, let's say urban projects, etc. excavate, explode, and then like a lot of dust and events and, you know, a lot of material pouring into a lot of resources. And then it stays there and, you know, we, we need to think about all the materials that um, go into this kind of like um, 
uh, how to say it, entity, do we really need all of this, right? Uh, or just um, looking at the moment we are experiencing culturally, I would say globally, how, you know, with the kind of Black Lives Matter movement and uh, the feminist movement, right? Um, is this, is this, isn't this a great moment to rethink the way we build architecture as well? Um, maybe that wasn't very articulate, but um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, uh, as opposed to building buildings, perhaps the focus should be on building experiences with what we have already. Mm -hmm. Very much agree. Um, and is this um, um, where all your working focuses come in? Um, um, Pina, would you just elaborate a little bit on uh, your list combines post-humanism, eco-nihilism, Anthropocene and feminist techno-science. So tell us a little bit more. Uh, what's <laughs> right. the philosophy? Oh, well, yeah, it's a mouthful, isn't it? Um, well, for me, you know, some of my decisions, uh, some of my architectural decisions are also very practical. For instance, um, I was, you know, in the talk, I mentioned this already, I was building, I was designing a pavilion or a, an architectural installation for the Venice Biennial, Venice Architecture Biennial uh, past May was supposed to be installed. Now it's uh, deferred to the next year. But during the design process, I already generated a lot of digital assets. So um, perhaps again, Louis can respond to this. Uh, in today's kind of uh, you know uh, creative platform, I'm constantly looking at digital geometries, like and then I render them, or you know I'm like measuring them in a digital platform. Of course, I like pen and paper, but this is how we operate in the architecture world. We already have the assets, so it's really simple. It's uh, it's felt like a very simple transition to start with those assets and take it to a platform that's really built for showing assets like that, like a game engine, right? And um, of course, there are other challenges, like because when you're creating a digital experience, you have to think about UI, UX, and uh, what the audience will do if it's a multiplayer or a, a platform that involves multiple people, how are they going to interact? There is a lot of coding in mode, so there's a lot more that you uh, need to know uh, it's just not taking a digital asset and dropping it you know, in a VR headset and it works. You need to think about it, but it's at, at the same time simple, a simple transition and it's doable. And I don't need to convince a client to pay me a billion dollars or whatever to, you know, or find a site, it's there. So these were all really interesting and appealing to me as someone who wants to as we just said, create experiences. And I think I see a lot of young architecture students uh, showcasing their work also like online and with using you know, these digital platforms. So I think there's already kind of a trend in this direction. Yeah, I think I would, I would actually also agree. I mean, the digital um, makers that we, that we now have just affords us a degree of freedom that just isn't there if you if you think about um, having to build it in actual uh, physicality, for example, I mean, you, you were talking about it, I think, also in your talk when you spoke about uh, your uh, artwork that was suddenly able to be so much larger and to be experienced in such a different, uh, different way. I think that would also make it possible to, to experience one and the same thing in different paths and have a, a, a larger diversity of experiences of the same thing while still being... Yeah. Um, very easily doable, I guess, if, uh, with a certain right. skill set. Right, and I, I think we have to highlight that, of course, it never replaces the actual tactile sensory experience of being in a building or, I don't know, going and touching the stone. or. But in fact, in museums, they don't let you touch anything. So you're exactly. just like walking around like... And, you know, okay, welcome to VR. You can't touch anything here either, right? So it's, I think it's kind of a really practical way to continue to be creative and continue to have a voice without really repeating or perpetuating the paradigms uh, of the last 50 years, which I think has brought the entire planet, the oceans, etc., uh, to the brink of extinction. 
right? I, uh, you know, f- for Hollow Ocean, I talk about it as my response to a call by uh, oceanographer Sylvia Earle, because I watched a talk by this wonderful woman in 2009, 2009, when she won the TED Prize, and they asked her, what's your wish? And she said, my wish, in short, is that we protect the oceans and that we use whatever we have uh, available to us to do this. And the numbers she gave are grave, right? You know, 90% of the big fish gone, acidification and uh, global warming, the systemic effects, we're experiencing it even more this summer. So there's this kind of urgency, right? And what do you do? How do you respond to this as an architect? Oh, I'm going to use green sustainable materials, but I'll still have an, you know, air conditioner that it's just kind of like it doesn't feel right to just mindlessly continue the way we've been building things. Right. I just think that this is a great moment to kind of brainstorm and talk and uh, connect these communities who are feeling similarly towards these issues, like Sarah was saying this vertical kind of virility of architecture, like can there be other paradigms we can follow, like architecture that disappears, for instance, right? Uh, Do we need to build to kind of put our name up there, like on the moon, on wherever site it is, or do we build uh, transient spaces, transitory spaces, just to kind of create learning experiences or community building experiences, let's call them, you know, Uh, positive human experiences. Um, I think that's where my mind is at as uh, someone who is also, you know, who sees that it's harder and harder for especially younger generation to, uh, you know, uh, get these kind of more conventional jobs or conventional architectural practices. Mm -hmm. Um, Beautiful. Thank you. So our Time is almost uh, um, one away, and uh, but maybe as a closing statement from both of you, I want to bring in another uh, keyword because we've been hearing this in the past days. How do we construct? We are in architecture today. How do we construct and build relationship in spaces? And maybe you just mm-hmm. combine it to your closing statement. Because it's all about relationship, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is. I think also to be touching on what Pina said uh, just now, um, the kind of, uh, if if we think about building as less permanent, as less, you know, space taking, um, I think this also means that we are afforded a certain, that it's easier to to, um, to uh, create a sort of uh, sense of participation. If you're, if the past days kind of um, uh, ring back in my head, I remember that there was a lot of calls for actually creating um, exhibitions with audiences instead of just, you know, having them as passive visitors. And I think also with the, with the changing perspectives and like a, an increased diversity in, in what perspectives we see in museums. Um, I think that would make it uh, a lot easier to have, to also be open to change. And I think that's, that would be something that I guess we all have to find in ourselves, the kind of the courage to, um, to actually say, maybe this has to be thought entirely different and we just have to throw some things overboard. Yeah, exactly. I think this kind of, uh, it would perhaps be called more experiential. No, that's that I keep repeating that term. But architecture for community building would require a, a different set of intellectual tools, I think. It's it's just not building, you know, walls and here's the door and get inside. It doesn't work anyways anymore. Um anymore anyways. But um I think the only relationship that we have to construct is the relationship to live the living world. That's what I believe, because we hampered that relationship tremendously. Uh, there are generations who uh, spend, you know, uh, there are people who spend their entire life disconnected. I, I don't even want to use that dis- word disconnected, but constructing our relationship with the natural world and the living world 
And uh, to do that, constructing our relationship with each other, I think are two goals that I would like to see achieved by the architecture of uh, today and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Love your thoughts, love your ideas. So thank you very much, Pina. Over to San Diego. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Um, and thank you, Louise. Keep going. All the best. Um, yeah, this was sort of my last set. <laughs> I will follow tomorrow's closing, of course. And thank you, the organizers, for having me and uh, letting me meet all those wonderful guests here in the Future Forward uh, panels. Uh, yeah, big up to the technical support, always highly busy and mighty effective backstage. Thank you. And hope to see you again in an inspiring future space. Maybe, yeah, let's call it. Let's meet in a museum. Okay, bye bye. Thank you, Thank everyone. You bye. Bye. The coral reefs are an example of complex architecture of nature. About two-thirds of the world's coral reefs suffer major long-term degradation or are severely damaged. Children born today may be the last generation to see coral reefs and the beauty of this complexity of underwater architecture. Which brings me to our topic of tomorrow, museums and failure. Thanks for your engagement today, your questions, comments, your ideas and your inspiration. And also thank you in the name of the organizing partners, Institut für Auslandsbeziehungen, Republika, Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin, Germany's Federal Foreign Office. I can't wait to see you all tomorrow. Stay with us and tune in on the last day of the Martin Roth Symposium 2020. But for now, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>